Okay. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Nick. Uh, I work on the Linux kernel and the LLVM compiler project at Google in Mountain View, California. Oh, um, hi. Uh, my name is Bill, and uh, I also work on um, uh, Linux, but like on the prod kernel uh, side, and um, also with LLVM as well. So. Um, so some of the goals of this project, um, I, I, I would say that uh, whenever you have a, a maybe a newish compiler that you're pointing at, at a code base that hasn't used that compiler before, um, kind of both the compiler and the code base stand to benefit from that. Um, so on the, on the source side of things, the Linux kernel benefits by getting kind of additional warning coverage. Um, I, I would say there's, there's quite a few patches that we've sent um, as far as just trying to drive the warning count uh, when compiling the kernel with Clang to zero. Um, so we're in, still have work to do there, but, but we've already upstreamed over like a few hundreds of patches um, related to that. Um, trying to reduce undefined behavior in, in, in the kernel. Um, there's, there's not a, a large amount of it, but there's a lot of code, so um, you always have issues there. Uh, the earlier talk on static analysis is actually kind of why I got into this whole project was I was just trying to run scan build on the compiler. Unfortunately, static analysis needs to know like what, how exactly are things defined via the pre-preprocessor and what symbols get included or, or not via like dash D flags and stuff. Um, and so you kind of basically need to be able to compile the source code in the first place to, to do then the static analysis. Um, so I basically got into this rabbit hole of, okay, well, let's get it building first, and then we can go do the static analysis later. So maybe at some point in the future I'll be able to revisit um, that. But um, some of the other stuff I'm really excited about is um, kind of the thread safety annotations. We use quite heavily in Google 3 C++ code um, for kind of statically verifying uh, thread safety. Um, you can kind of annotate your code and say, like, you must acquire this mutex or these mutexes in this order um, to protect these members of the struct or point to values and stuff like that. Otherwise, the dynamic analyses via um, like address sanitizer, undefined behavior sanitizer, thread sanitizer, all have uh, kernel variants as well that are implemented uh, in LLVM are really nice. Um, there's some, some cool newish new stuff that we're looking to do uh, in the kernel. A lot of issues, we're still working through a lot of them. But things like link time optimization, and even lately there's been some uh, research uh, uh, kind of post-link optimization stuff that, that we're, we're playing around with a little bit on, on our kernels. Um, and, and ideally, we want to lower the switching cost between compilers, right? Just like going back to economics, right, you have this like notion of substitute goods. And in order to kind of have substitute compilers, um, you need to lower the friction between swapping them in and out, right? And so that kind of puts this constraint on Clang that it, it needs to compile almost the same code as GCC. Um, not exactly, but you kind of can't even compete. You can't come to the table unless you can compile the same code. So um, if we can lower the cost of switching compilers, that makes it easy for other people to then like report bugs in the compiler and try things out and, and see how it works for them. Um, for improving LLVM, uh, we basically have a whole brand new customer to both give us kind of feature requests and help us figure out what features we're missing from either the, the C language standard um, or the various GNU extensions. Um, we can't compete with GCC if we can't build the same code kind of thing. So that, that's kind of a non-starter. Um, and then finally, just having more and more code to throw at your compiler helps you find more compiler bugs. Um, so some of the things that we're trying to do um, is actually create Linux distributions that are entirely built with Clang and LLVM. So uh, Android is in the process of moving there. If you have like a Pixel phone, those are already all entirely built. Um, with with uh, with Clang, uh, even the kernel. Um, so we're in the process of working with Android OEMs and vendors now on getting the whole ecosystem moved over to um, Clang built kernels as well. Uh, Chrome OS uh, is entirely all Clang built as well. Um, Open Mandriva is more of um, more I guess traditional Linux packages and is a project working through trying to get all of that code ported over and buildable with Clang. Um, and then Bill will talk a little bit about some of the work he's been doing on Google's production servers that are serving your traffic when you visit various Google properties. Um, so the earliest uh, history I could find was there's a, some project called the LLL project that has a few commits in 2011. I don't really know too much about it, but 
that's like some proof that someone here was trying to build the Linux kernel um, with Clang. So they have patches on top of a 2.6 kernel, which is like, I don't know, ancient history to me kind of thing. Um, then from 2012 to 2016 was the LLVM Linux project. They have a large set of patches um, that they that is actually a lot of the work that I started doing was kind of based like finding their patches and applying those, rebasing them, cleaning them up, um, and then in the process kind of upstreaming them as well. Um, and and I, they did a lot of good. They did a lot of really good work and found a, a lot of um, kind of standing issues in Clang and LLVM. Um, I think part of the issue that that they were having was um, both upstreaming of patches into the the kernel itself. Um, and then also getting fixes in on the Clang and LLVM side of things. Um, so around 2016, um, my coworker uh, Greg Hackman and I were looking into kind of getting this up and running on the on the Google Pixel. Right, I was looking into it for static analysis of the kernels. Um, and uh, around that time, uh, Greg came to me and was like, "Hey, I, I got this like up and running. Like it's building. Can you test and see if it's booting?" Kind of thing. And uh, at that same time, I noticed um, Mat Matthias Kalki on the Chrome OS kernel team uh, submitting fixes upstream to LKML for like fixing warnings reported by Clang. And so I, I kind of went over to Mat Matthias and, and showed him like what we were trying to do. And, and we started kind of collaborating on this stuff. And, and we kind of figured out like, hey, you know, there's a lot of really good patches from the LLVM Linux project. We should actually get those upstreamed or work through whatever issues upstream maintainers have um, and get that all up and running. So we actually had it up and running for Pixel 1. But due to the way feature releases and product cycles work, um, we were asked to kind of like give it more soak time. So we ended up shipping it, and Pixel 2 was the first device. I think we used Clang 4 um, to build the full is the ARM64 Linux kernel for that. Um, so that was the first one. Uh, then 2018 Chrome OS. Um, they, in the, I have two links in there. The first one's like I think in March was they f started flipping it on for their various LTS kernels. Um, and then by October, flipped it to be the default compiler. So all, all um, kernels going forward for Chrome OS are built with Clang as well. Um, in 2018, for Pixel 3, um, we got LTO working in the kernel and then control flow integrity analysis up and running. Um, that CFI helps with um, trying to prevent ROP chains um, in the kernel. And then, uh, so 2019, what are we, what are we working on? Um, I would say LLD support is, is imminent, at least for ARM64. On my, the day I was flying out here, uh, project manager was kind of bashing me over the head saying, like, how come these patches aren't in yet? And I'm like, oh, I got to clean up the commit messages. And, you know, there's still some work I need to do to properly kind of upstream them and get them reviewed properly kind of thing. But, you know, there, it's there. It's working. A little bit more work for x86, but ARM64 is ready to go. Um, as I'm go to, the patches are, are posted. Is, this is a feature that's used in, in uh, in the Linux kernel, um, x86 kind of requires it. Um, so support patches up are up for both the Clang side, the LLVM side. I have been hammering on them nonstop in the past two weeks um, using CReduce. I'll talk about later to basically find bugs in the implementation and make sure we have a high quality implementation before it lands and a bug free one. Um, I would say Clang's integrated assembler. Um, so LLVM tools, right, has a, LLVM has a lot of kind of substitutes, not just for the compiler, GCC, but also for bin utils. So the assembler and the linker and then NM and readelf and all these other you know, like obj tool, obj dump, strip kind of thing. Um, so there's definitely a long tail of, of all the tools. I would say integrated assembler is the one I'm most worried about. I think it has basically the longest tail of things that, that we need. Um, we're in the process of moving all of Android over. I'm working with OEMs on, on issues that they're seeing with it. Um, Prod kernel, which Bill will talk a little bit more about. Uh, part of, the other part of CFI is shadow call stack is another um, part of the, the ROP chain prevention. Thread safety analysis, I'm trying to get an intern this summer to help out, um, see if we can get this working in the kernel, because that would be nice. Uh, a lot of the bugs that I was fixing when I worked primarily on the Nexus and Pixel kernel team uh, came down to like th uh, concurrency bugs in, in third party drivers. Um, auto FDO is, is kind of like the next generation of, of PGO. Um, we want to do kind of uh, low overhead sampling uh, for ARM that requires ETM or on x86 it's last, last branch records. Um, then Bolt is like this cool thing that just came out of Facebook research uh, is post link optimization. There's some other things people are doing trying to see can we move that into the compiler. 
or does it need to be like done after the link stage and what are the issues there? Um, and then trying to, trying to get Clang integrated into the upstream uh, Linux kernel continuous integrations uh, system. So kernel CI, uh, I would say support for Clang is imminent. They just re-architected it to support multiple different compilers in order to report bugs or regressions in different versions of GCC. And then for them, now it's generic enough to just add Clang to it. Um, zero day bot, we were like this close from getting it integrated and then x86 maintainers like forced the use of Asm Goto the week I was talking with the zero day bot team. So that was a little unfortunate. Um, but once we have Asm Goto landed, we'll start up those talks again. Um, if you want to try it out, usually when you build your kernel, you end up doing like some, you play around with your kernel configuration, like a make local mod config is kind of the basic target, but um, make has variables you can set at the command line, you set cc equals clang and you're off to the races. Um, you can set ld is equal, equal to ld.lld to start trying to link. Um, there's some issues I need to fix upstream, but that's going to be the command, right, how to invoke lld. And then when you cross compile, one of the things I like about kind of clang is kind of the, the default build of Clang is, has all of the different backends built into it. So with binutils and GCC, you typically install like a cross tool version that has a prefix in front of it. Um, and so because we're not using Clang's integrated assembler, uh, we still kind of shell out to uh, GNU AS. Um, then when you're cross compiling, you need to know that target triple. So uh, if you were gonna cross compile for ARM64, which I do commonly for my x86, workstation, I'll, you, the, those are the environmental variables you set kind of thing to do the cross compile. Um, these are very rough measurements. I don't know if, if git grep supports Perl regexes, probably would have been nicer, but these are like very rough counts of, of commit messages that mention Clang or LLVM in the kernel. Uh, probably lots of the ones that just mentioned Clang may be related to eBPF. I didn't really do any very scientific measurements there. Um, but then LLVM as well has quite a few um, commits now in it that say like, hey, this is something that we fixed or implemented um, because the Linux kernel is, is making use of this. Oh, uh, my turn. Hi, so uh, first off, I'm going to apologize. I'm fighting a cold, um, so I may start coughing. Um, so the production kernel is basically uh, a different beast from uh, what he's working on, which is uh, Android. Uh, the Android tends to work more towards the um, top of tree Linux, while uh, the production kernel has various um, uh, different, uh, what do you call them, long-term? Uh, oh, different LTS branches they're based off of? Yeah, LTS branches. Um, so the one that I'm using is kind of an ancient one. I, th I think it's like pre 4.5, uh, but anyway, it's 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 all kind of a, a more of an experimental type situation right now. Um, well, asterisk. It's it's more than just experimental. We really want to do it, uh, but we need to get um, like performance there, uh, for instance. And I'll go I'll go into that in a bit um, here. So what I did is uh, I uh, I went to the I got to the team about a year ago, and Luckily, the Android team had already done uh, LTO on Linux, and so I was able to use their patches and get uh, our kernel, uh, you know, to compile with Linux. I'm sorry, with LTO. Um, basically, it just took a bunch of uh, changes in the build system. Uh, mostly, it has to do with the fact that during LTO, you generate, uh, you know, LVMIR files instead of ELF files. Um, so you can, you really don't generate ELF files until you start linking the uh, VM Linux.o file, and that's when you do all of the LTO uh, optimizations. So the built-in.o files that are generated are not really, well, they're just not really archives at all. Uh, so basically what you're doing is you're creating a thin archive um, so that it just lists all of the .o files that you want to uh, then shove to the linker, and then the linker will take all of those and do its magic and create the uh, uh, .o file. Um, I started by using the gold linker, uh, because that's what you're supposed to use. Um, and uh, the, you know, then in order to get the uh, actual final uh, VM Linux, 
I uh, linked it with the BFD linker. Um, there is some issues, however, with the gold linker, and uh, our teams internally at, at Google no longer support the gold linker, so basically they said use LLD, and so uh, about a month ago I went ahead and switched us over to LLD. So. <coughs> Excuse me. So anyway, um, like I said, uh, the gold linker had bugs. Uh, in fact, it was asserting on me a lot. Um, LLD worked great. However, it turns out that when you use LTO uh, and you're also linking uh, elf.o files with it, the LTO files will basically just be generated as one huge .o file, uh, .o elf file, and then the other ones are kind of scattered here. And that wouldn't be necessarily an issue. However, with Linux, they have this uh, section called uh, init uh, data. And in there, they have a list of uh, init calls, and those have to be in a specific order um, because you know, they're initializing uh, structures and so on before other ones. Um, and we were just not uh, able to replicate that. Um, so I, I, had, I basically had to come up with a, a kind of a hack to get around it. Um, so first off, uh, this is kind of where you define an init call here. And so what I do is I'm popping it into a section that's uh, named, you know, after the uh, uh, the file that it occurs in, um, and then during linking, I create a really massive linker script that will go through and reorder all of the uh, uh, sections, basically, um, so that they are in the quote unquote correct order as they were as they appear on the uh, command line. Um, this is absolutely horrible. <laughs> Uh, it actually causes the compilation or the linking to increase from about, you know, 1.2 minutes to over three. Um, and there are kind of ways I can maybe get around that, but uh, in general, it's just kind of bad. So please don't tell anybody. <laughs> um, and so now we're going to discuss uh, a few uh, interesting issues that we kind of came across while, while developing this. So I'll let him go first. Sure. Um, so just in the interest of time, I, I won't get into all these, but um, the very first one, which was, which was interesting, was so if you see this statement here, you're declaring a variable foo. Uh, it's a long, long. Um, so we had this issue in Clang on 32-bit hosts, uh, where, a long, where according to their ABI, a uh, long, long should be 64 bits. Um, and so you're saying, like, please use register EDX, for instance, so you can guess which architecture this is. Um, please store it in a, re uh, in a register kind of thing. Um, the thing that's curious is if you're on a 32-bit host and you're saying use EDX, which is a 32-bit register, and you're saying you want a long, long, well, where's the other 32 bits of that 64-bit variable? Does anyone know? No? Okay. Well, basically, you have to implement bug-for-bug -bug compatibility with GCC on how does it choose the next 32-bit register. And if you say, like, e ESP, it'll just, like, crash. So uh, yeah, that, that was kind of interesting. Um, one of the bugs that we ran into with AR64 that was kind of clever, uh, the kernel futex code, which is like a synchronization primitive, would explicitly dereference null to see, like, how does the hardware perform and how does it behave and select this, in select this implementation, otherwise this implementation. Um, and uh, AR64 has an explicit zero register, which is nice. So Clang was trying to generate code that said, like, dereference the XZR is like the zero register. The issue is that there is no in valid encoding for that. So, like, you can write that in assembly, and then your assembler will choke and say, like, there's no bit pattern to represent this. So that was kind of funny. Um, GNU inline is like, if someone asks you, like, what are the semantic differences between C89 and C99, like, how extern inline works. That's one. The kernel makes use of this. Uh, I wrote the documentation on this and like have the patch in the kernel for this. I'm not really proud of it, but that, that's something you can go look up if you're interested. Uh, single symbol clashes with the C standard library. It's like header file, like, uh, I don't know, if you were to pound include st stood IO or something, and like the kernel itself doesn't have a C runtime. It implements its own uh, kind of helper functions. Um, and then there was like collisions there. Um, Custom calling conventions, VLAIS, is a variable length array, and then you can also put a variable length array in the middle of a struct, not at the 
at the end of a struct, but in the middle kind of thing was an issue. Um, I think the one that I would be most interested in showing you is, uh, is this one. So quick interview question. How can you write code that is valid at O2 and not at O0? Think about it. OK, did anyone get this? Uh, might be hard to see here, but basically we have a static inline function. Inline function has some inline assembly. It has some constraints on it saying this is going to be an immediate value, like the number 42. And so when we compile this at 02, everything's semantically valid. But if we don't inline that static uh, inline function, it is no longer semantically valid kind of thing. Um, the, the kernel is using this in a few places. Uh, coincidentally, everywhere where, where it uses asmgoto is wrapped in this pattern. So it's making testing asmgoto very difficult, um, especially if you want to make sure like uh, inlining, or especially because the initial instance of patches of asmgoto skip inlining support. Uh, so one of the things that's kind of interesting is uh, if you use attribute always inline, it doesn't mean always inline, because the compiler needs to know how to do the inlining. And a lot of times you'll see like fix me to do implement later, not needed for correctness kind of thing. So like these need to be macros if you want it to always be inlined kind of thing. Um, and I don't know, uh, Bill, we'll talk about some of these two other ones in, in a little bit. Oh, there we go. Cool. Oh, cool. Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, so there, there were a couple of uh, issues. Um, uh, one of them, uh, actually, this would have not been a problem if I was using a more recent kernel because the uh, patch uh, as uh, what was already existing in an upstream kernel. Um, but basically what was happening is we, during one of our tests, uh, the, the machine would just simply assert. Um, but, and I, I whittled the, the test cases down and uh, I found out that like in one of the um, crypto, uh, yeah, crypto library, our .o files. If you compiled it with um, O1, everything went fine. If you compiled it with O2, everything crashed. And so it happened, to, it, it had to do with inlining, actually. Um, and it wasn't a bug in Clang, which is what I thought initially. Um, it was some weird, some weird aligning issues. Uh, so basically, because Linux does just horrible things with uh, pointers. Um, it has these, this thing called uh, SG set buff. And what this does is you are basically setting a buffer inside of this um, uh, structure. And it's going to be aligned at a certain place and so on. Um, so inside of SG set buff, it's uh, uh, the offset here is. Um, uh, 12, by, uh, 12 bit aligned, as you can see. Uh, so when it's not inlined, uh, Clang is looking at that and it doesn't really uh, try and calculate the value or anything like that. So it just leaves the uh, zero FFF alone. Um, however, when you do inline it, you get uh, the bottom four bits turned into zeros. And because you have this variable uh, variable length array being defined like this, and S and D are actually defined towards the end. There's one variable afterwards, but it's a it's not allocated any stack. So um, basically, D here is the last uh, thing on the stack, about right here. And what was happening is after it set this buffer like this it would uh, put a whole bunch of data in there, of course, and it would end up overwriting the return address because of the misalignment, basically. Um, all the you know, lower bits there would just be cleared out, and it would be off by eight, and you know, everything would blow up. Um, so that was, that was kind of an interesting bug to find. Um, but uh, let's see. Oh, in the, in, I'm sorry, in the uh, resolution is basically to specify the stack alignment uh, on the command line, um, which had, like I said, had been uh, fixed by a patch um, probably a couple, like last year or something like that, or, yeah, but um, 
uh, it just hadn't made it into one of our LTS uh, kernels yet. Yeah, I think that was Matthias's patch wrote that. I think so. Yeah. 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 Oops, you went by my other ones. Damn you. Okay. Um, he had mentioned earlier that there had been uh, kind of like lacking support uh, for some of the GCC features in Clang. And one of the big ones was uh, built-in constant P. Um, it wasn't that we were getting it wrong. It's just that GCC was, oh, geez, doing what GCC does. Uh, and, uh, I mean, a lot of built-ins aren't super portable, aren't, aren't super well-defined in the first place kind of thing. Well, basically, uh, the definition are the Basically, the definition of what a, a built-in does for GCC is, what does GCC do? Yeah. <laughs> and so that's it. Um, so basically, after inlining happens, GCC is still able to say, oh, is this, uh, uh, you, you know, is the variable to, or the argument to the built-in constant P, is it an integer, if, or, you know, a constant? If it is, we'll just go ahead and say, yes, it is. Otherwise, no. Um, and in the vast majority of cases, this is used to take the slow path as opposed to the uh, quick path. Um, in one of the newer kernels, uh, it turns out that kernel hardening actually kind of fails. Uh, you would get this you know, scary message here uh, without it. Um, so actually, both uh, two, James Knight and I uh, kind of tackled this. James Knight did the LOVMIR transform our edition. Uh, using this is constant uh, intrinsic, um, and I, I, I went ahead and modified the front end, the Clang front end, which is not actually uh, the code base that I'm most used to, um, but I became used to it because my God, I had to touch every part of it. <laughs> so uh, Richard Smith uh, asked me to, or one of the main maintainers of Clang asked me. Uh, to implement a uh, more or less a wrapper class called the, called constant expert, um, and it is the correct way of doing it. It's just the long way of doing it. Uh, but the benefit of it is that it's kind of a more natural way of doing it, and also it allows us to support uh, C++ features in the future. And essentially, what it does is kind of what the name says is. If you are in a constant expression, then you are assuming that you are in a constant context, um, and that can de and that can determine whether you're going to uh, evaluate it early uh, in the Clang front end or late in the LLVM IR, our you know middle end. Um, and so, yeah, we were able to get past that, and now we are uh, uh, bug compatible at least with that in with Clang, our DCC. So, and I think you are, no, that's you, okay. and you did. So. Cool. Uh, yeah, so if you're interested in uh, how you might be able to help, so I highly recommend this project. This is how I was able to start kind of contributing to the upstream Linux kernel and to LLVM itself. Um, so we have a bug tracker. I try to like highlight like good first issues. So we're happy to hand out bugs if you're looking to either start contributing to either one of these code bases. I'm more than happy to help you. Shoot me an email, it's on the first slide. Um, I'm more, I, that's, you know, just my thing is like, how do I get people involved in contributing to the open source software that they love and use every day is something that's personally important to me. Um, we're running continuous integration uh, for various architectures. So we have ARM64, x86-64, um, ARM v7, ARM v6, ARM v5, PowerPC64, Power PC Little Endian, and uh, PowerPC 32-bit uh, running continuously. Um, the mainline Linux kernel, Linux Next, uh, LTS branches 419, 414, 4944. Um, so it's a poor man's CI, like cron job running every night kind of thing. But for all of these various, like, I don't know, 30 something targets kind of thing. Um, so you can check that out. It's just running on, on Travis. Uh, we have a link to other talks and other kind of material if you're interested in, in finding out kind of more about the history and, and the project and stuff. Um, Godbolt.org is amazing. That's the link I showed you earlier with the, the, the code that was only inlineable. That's like, if you want to communicate to a compiler developer a bug, like send them a Godbolt link, okay? That is like the shared language that compiler people understand. Like, here is a clear case. Here's what GCC does. 
this is what I want in Clang, or here's what I code, and here's how it crashes Clang, right, kind of thing. Um, C reduce, I just wrote a blog post on it. It's incredible. I've, it, I have like a, at least 10 compiler bugs that I've found with it. Um, it you kind of give it a shell script where you put whatever you want in it, and then you say like a uh, source file, and it mutates the source file, paring it down until you have like a nice, concise reproducer. Um, so I found like errors at, at link time. Um, you can say like the, the, sh the script returns a different return code based on if this symbol is found after running nm or not or something on a on a binary or does it crash the compiler or does the compiler produce uh, strange output or, or strange disassembly? Um, bear is this utility that hooks make for and it kind of spits out a compile commands.json file which you can then feed into static analysis tools like uh, scan build, Clang static analyzer or uh, was it Clang CPP check, right, was the other utility, I think, that uses it. Um, or alternatively, the kernel will spit out these .o.cmd files that have all the commands uh, for each translation unit when you build. The issue with that is it only produces them, I believe, if compilation is successful, which we could probably fix that in kbuild. But um, that, that's helpful as well. Um, just because, like, when C reducing a bug, you sometimes need to know exactly, like, what flags were passed to the compiler to reproduce a given issue. And so, like, getting the comp those flags out of compile commands.json or the .o.cmd file is critical. Same thing with stack analysis is different um, command line flags will change your translation unit kind of once it's been pre-processed kind of thing. Make sure you grab for the right error message. Yes. Yep. So, yep. I've had that issue before where I just say, like, grep for, like, a crash. And then it paired it down to some like bizarro C syntax thing that like, and and kind of, kind of uh, the Clang's maintainer is like, well, do we need to fuzz this this the C front end like if it if it's not valid C code like if the compiler crashes or not right is it really a bug I don't know, um, cool so okay. uh, that's all we have thank you very much. And uh, we're happy to take questions now at this time. Or, sorry, I guess it's time up. Oh, yeah, yeah. How do you deal with the conversion option in general when it was violated? Because so many options, and what was the minimum set? Yeah, so the, the question was, was around uh, what set of kernel configuration options do we use? So the, the kernel itself has a build system called kbuild that is highly configurable, right? So it depends on the distribution, right? Like, you'll have distributions of Linux where there's no guarantee what kind of hardware they're going to run on. So they're going to compile a big kernel image that has tons of drivers in it because someone's going to try to put Debian on their toaster or their faucet or something, right? So just turn everything on. For Android, particularly for Pixel, you know, we have one hardware configuration, right? So we're going to pare our kernels down and know exactly what we're running. But then, like, we may have out-of-tree drivers that are problematic and things as well. Um, and so that's definitely an issue of, of does it build or not, right? So someone might come to me and say, like, well, can it build a kernel outright? And my question is usually like, well, what are your configs, right? Because the hard thing with the kernel, like, baseline, what we run in CI is we want to make sure that the def configs build. So each architecture has a recommended kind of set of configurations. Um, so, so that's kind of what we cover continuously. Uh, from there, uh, we try to run all yes, all yes config builds every so often. The issue with all yes config, which turns on lots of configs, is the kernel has a lot of configs that are mutually exclusive. And so uh, like you get this implementation of this function or that, depending on the config. So all yes doesn't mean like all the code in the kernel. So there's probably code hidden somewhere in the kernel that will crash Clang or Clang can't compile. And it's like a matter of finding it. So the kernel has something called rand config which kernel CI does run. So once they have Clang support, they'll probably help us find it. It's just a random coin flip. So you have to flip that coin a lot yeah, to, to find all the bugs and stuff. So. Uh, they're on Fabricator. Uh, I linked to them from the slides. Uh, if, if not, if you go to our issue tracker, they're like posted over there kind of thing as well. So if you, you can pull them down on top of mainline uh, Clang, rebuild Clang, and then try it out in the kernel. Uh, you'll run into the issue with the static always inline. Uh, I have a patch for x86 that converts, converts those all to, uh, to macros. Uh, for ARM64, that rabbit hole got really deep, and I never finished that patch. Um, but uh, it's a starting point if you're, if you're interested. So can I build on x86 
uh, you'll still need the out of tree patch because inlining support is not implemented in the ASMGO2 patches yet. So, so the, the plan is to land, uh, yes, yes, that, that is the plan is like one, once Clang has support for ASMGO2, then we're going to work on getting it to be able to inline basic blocks that have ASMGO2 st statements in them kind of thing. And then the goal is theoretically there should be no other bugs, but sometimes you don't have visibility beyond like one bug. So you're like, yes, I fixed it, and then you try it out, and then something else is broken. So I can't promise you, but I think it should work kind of thing after that. But um, Oh, I mean, alternatively, like, uh, alternatively, you can revert the kernel's use of asmgo2, forcing it kind of thing. It's not, not a real solution, but, you know, it, it, you still get a working kernel kind of thing. So. Uh, one of the big problems we had in NLP and Linux was that we had to track three different uh, patch sources. LLVM, all is running. Kernel, all is running. And our own patches, all is flipping between the two. And because we had like a, just two or three build boards, like x86 and one arm, uh, and the wireless one like in the KMU, we, we didn't, it, it, it was hard enough to keep track of all of these three sources in a single mm -hmm. configuration. Mm -hmm. And you guys have like 30 something configuration. How do you find the, the, where the bug is? Is it in LLVM or in the kernel or in your own patch? So, so eventually we're looking to like get help from kernel CI and zero day bot for, uh -huh. for spotting these regressions. And kernel CI is, is doing like, they pin the, 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 the kernel version and then try with different versions of Clang, like top of tree Clang. Okay. And like they'll report to us when people break the Clang and LLVM trees which is like pretty frequently, <laughs> which is kind of frustrating. But it's good that we're getting eyes and coverage and stuff. So usually like I'll, I'll kind of forward these reports to LLVM developers saying, hey, you probably already know this. Someone probably poked you. But in case they didn't, we're, you're breaking the Linux kernel right now and kind of thing. Um, then I would say on the kernel side, like we're trying to do like always have patches upstream, have zero or like minimize the delta as much as possible so we're not carrying patches around kind of thing. So it's like as soon as we have a fix, it goes upstream and, and we work with the kernel maintainers to, to make, make sure we get a fix in kind right. of thing. And this is no inline ASM then? Because there's a lot of inline ASM problems. Uh, so so we, disable, we, we, we disable no integrated AS okay. kind of thing for our builds for now. Uh -huh. uh, for, for the kernel makes use of assembly, both external sort assembly files, yeah. but then also the inline assembly, yeah. which is even more complicated because it has a whole constraint language with it. and, and so, and like the kernel abuse extensively of non-standard assembly. They have C code generated by the inline assembly, that, and there's then recompiled in, as a, as an assembly file by the C compiler. Uh, ab abuse is an accurate term when <laughs> talking about the code base. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, any other questions? What's your plan for plugins? Uh, the, um. Good question. So the question is about what is the plan for plugins? Um, so. Uh, the kernel is, has, uh, I think, checked into the source even, like some, some GCC plugins, um, and then some are maintained externally. So LLVM does have a, a plugin system. Uh, when I think back to the earlier talk today, that was an excellent talk that was about tooling and, and how to support kind of this ABI instability in LLVM. I think that, that's probably like a good thing to point to as far as like, now you, you have a plugin, but how do you guarantee it works with the given compiler version that a user has, especially if the compiler doesn't have a stable ABI itself? So from a plugin uh, maintenance perspective, it makes my skin crawl a little bit. But it's not impossible. It does have a plugin system. And I think plugins are useful. I think anyone who thinks of reaching for a plugin as a tool needs to sit down and really think hard, should this be implemented as a plugin or in the compiler itself? So for instance, I'll give a case. Um, a recent talk at LinuxConf AU was saying, hey, we use a GCC plugin to default initialize all variables. Uh, I think, personally, I think that's better implemented just in the compiler. And there's actually discussion about this for C++. And there's actually disagreement within the LLVM community, people saying, oh, you're going to fork C++ and create another dialect. You can't do this. And I feel like saying, well, for C, which we c development has kind of stopped on, like, can we please have this, since we already have our own dialect anyways that we use in the kernel. Uh, like kind of every dash F flag you add, um, like to me this could be another dash F default initialize, right? Yep. And there's no need for a plugin. Plugins are great if you want to like hack something up and play with the compiler and get something working. Um, I would say the best case where I say plugins make the most sense is when you have 
you need compiler technology for one given project. Because then, if you were going to say, like, to submit this to the compiler vendor and say, this is only used in this one code, code base, they're going to tell you to get lost. They're not going to want to maintain this plugin system because whatever, whatever maintenance overhead there is kind of yeah, thing. This only works if the compiler version is fixed, which in GCC, it's normally what happens. They have GCC 5 forever. Right. In LLVM, you know, fixing in GCC in LLVM 6 or LLVM 7 doesn't make sense because it just progressed so quickly that you can't get a plugin that worked in 7. Don't care, it's drug. Mm -hmm. right. So it's, it's a completely different reality. Yep. Sorry. Yep. Time's up. Okay. Thank you, Thank you so much, everyone. We appreciate it. <laughs>